In the last class, we set the scene for this somewhat controversial thesis about why or how the Union defeated the Confederacy. Now, basically that outline there is that the Union pursued a military strategy of the Anaconda Plan, of surrounding and constricting the South, whereas the South strategy, overall strategy, was one of King Cotton, where we have the goods um, that will allow us to survive, that will bring Europe in on our behalf. So our view is that the key to the war and the outcome of the war was the battle at sea, where one side did wear uniforms but did not shoot to kill, and that's the Union blockade fleet. On the other side, they didn't even wear uniforms, and they never fired their guns, or very rarely fired their guns, and that's the blockaders. This is where the real important battle is won or lost. Now, of course, with the Union blockade, they're capturing ships, they're capturing cargo, they're forcing the blockade runners to use smaller, faster, um, using engines rather than sails, um, and so they're forcing higher costs on these blockade runners. Prices of goods in the South uh, increase, and not just for monetary reasons, but because of the blockade itself. And what we're going to see is that the blockade increases certain prices much faster, much higher than others. And as you see in the book, in uh, Chapter 2, uh, there's a lot of evidence, there's a lot of concern about the fact that luxury goods seem to be imported from Europe and were readily available. The prices were high, uh, but they were readily available, whereas necessities were going up faster and were more difficult to come by. So, and when we speak of luxuries and necessities, that's really bad language in terms of economics. In economics, there, there is no particular meaning to necessities. So we don't ever talk about, in economics classes, need. We always talk in terms of want. And, of course, needs are those things that people want a great deal, or must have in their own mind. So a word like need is a four-letter word in economics. In the South, um, much, of everything, much of everything had to be imported. Anything that was made out of metal, machinery, medicines, clothing, everything that was manufactured, in other words, tended to be imported either from the north or from Europe. Things that were partially produced in the south, but also imported, that was another class of goods. Uh, that would include beef, um, certain grains that were both grown in the south, but also had to be imported in, into the south to meet all of the demand. Then there was domestically produced products, which were domestically produced in the South, but by and large all consumed in the South and not exported. And that would include things like pork or swine and corn. And then finally, there are the export products. And uh, primarily on this account, you would certainly include cotton and tobacco. But there were a few other products that were um luxury goods, excuse me, were export goods. Now, the idea that in a wartime situation, your imports consist heavily of goods that are thought to be luxury goods, specialty foods, luxurious clothing, uh, cognac, uh, things of this nature, while you don't have enough food to feed the troops and the, and the citizens, uh, seems irrational. It seems illogical. It certainly seems self-defeating. And so what we try to do, particularly in this chapter, is explain why this situation would exist. Why would you have this otherwise irrational phenomenon coming on board at this crucial time? Well, first of all, we notice that in the import manifests of the blockade runners, we do see a lot of luxury goods, but we also see things like sewing needles and quinine, medicines and, and basic, you know, things needed for the production of clothing and the maintenance of clothing. So it wasn't all luxury goods 
that were coming through the blockade. But the blockade certainly raises uh, shipping costs. Uh, something to, you know, what is the cost of bringing goods into the country? That's really the key thing. You really see um, the shipping cost increasing at exorbitant rates. And what does this do? Well, it raises the price of imports. And that's something that seems fairly obvious. But let's take a look at that. in graphical form. Imports into the South, you take a uh, demand on the part of Southerners for a particular good, and let's say the supply is coming in from Europe. So you originally have a quantity coming in before the war, and a price of this imported good, let's say it's clothing. What the blockade does is it makes it more difficult to supply this good. So we show an increase in the difficulty of supplying the good graphically by shifting the uh, supply curve. And so we move from this market position to this market position. So that the price in the south increases and the quantity that's being brought in and purchased is going to decline. And the price in Europe is actually going to fall. Okay, so the a big chunk of the total revenue here is going to the blockaders. And we didn't even really concern ourselves with shipping costs originally, but now with the blockade, the blockaders are picking up all this profit. I guess I should have not used red for profit, but you get the idea. Now, on the other side of the world, let's see what's happening. Imports into Europe, and in this case we'll just use cotton, most dominant. Product in the export trade. And here we have the, the supply coming in from the south, the southern states, and the equilibrium or market clearing price and quantity that would exist prior to the war. Okay, but imports leaving the south, going to Europe, also face the blockade. It's not a one way blockade, it's a two way blockade, and actually, the blockaders are more interested in themselves in nabbing the cotton going out rather than the coffee going in. But it does the same thing. It reduces the supply with this blockade. And raises the price and reduces the quantity. Okay, so these are all commonsensical things from what we know about blockades and the difficulty and the cost. Um, but look at here. The price in the south of cotton is expected to fall because of the blockade. Because it's so, more, so much more difficult to get out, the local price of cotton is going to actually be depressed. It's the price in Europe that's going to be high. So again, the blockaders are going to take 
this whole area of profit. So the more strict this blockade is, the higher the cost of running that blockade. And this wedge develops where the South isn't getting very much for its cotton, yet they're paying through the nose for the products that, that it is importing. So this blockade has an overall impoverishing effect on the people of the South, the economy of the South. It's a very detrimental effect. And so the more successful the blockade is, the worse it is going to be for the Southern economy and, of course, the war effort. Um, and on the flip side of that, it's going to make it easier for the Union armies uh, attacking because this, this Confederate armies aren't going to be as well provisioned and the uh, people on the home front are going to have less food, clothing, and shelter. Uh, they're going to be less able to maintain their transportation system and so on. So this is a very, very central problem uh, for the Confederates. Yes. I, I wonder what is, is this not the, almost identically the same as what the Southern self-imposing embargo would would have done or did did do or and, and is that not foreseeable? This is the the prices in Europe we might have they would have gone out the market before that and it didn't have the right way. Yes, I mean, it, it's, it's basically going to have the same effect in terms of cotton. Um, it would have a different effect in terms of clothing, possibly, but certainly would have the same effect in cotton. And the idea there would have been, okay, if we imposed an airtight embargo and essentially reduced the price down to nothing, nobody's selling, that's what an embargo is, uh, the price in Europe would have skyrocketed, and the idea is at that point um, the Europeans would have broken down the blockade. And so the, the idea is, well, the Confederates, cotton doesn't deteriorate, so if we can hold on for one season and force the intervention, we'll get all our money back next year. Um, it didn't work that way, though, obviously. I, I got the idea of from reading the book, the book that, that uh, cotton from Egypt and India was more uh, expensive. Yes. And uh, I wondered why uh, why it was that was the case. Why were their production costs are pretty good, uh, and their input costs are not? Uh, uh, why why was that cotton more expensive? Their well, I think. I think the, I'm not sure about Egypt, but I think Indian, Indian cotton was, it wasn't, um, it just took a long ways, you know, transportation wise, uh, you'd have to go a very long ways. Egypt is closer, but I think that the, the local economy, um, couldn't expand output, um, because of the constraints on the amount of arable land in Egypt. So, you know, they, it wasn't like you just plant more cotton in the United States. You've got plenty of land. Uh, in Egypt, if you planted cotton, that means you weren't planting food. And so there was a much higher opportunity cost in Egypt uh, for growing cotton. And so that, I think those are the, the reasons and the fact that the things that I mentioned last week about developing cotton agriculture uh, took a while to develop over time. It wasn't something you could just, like today, you go from cotton to soybeans with a flip of a coin, literally with a flip of a coin. So <coughs> things were different. But now I want to try to explain something that's very tricky uh, in economics. It's about relative prices, about one good versus another, and use that approach to explain why luxuries were available, so-called luxuries, and why necessities were in such short supply. Any kind of necessity that was coming in from Europe um, tended to be uh, in short supply. Well, um, 
This is sometimes called the Elchin Allen effect in terms of looking at prices. And um, it's just a little something that appeared in his college textbook a number of years ago uh, based on a letter to the editor, not George's. Uh, this lady in the state of Washington where they grow a lot of apples was writing to the editor of the paper to complain that all of the good apples were being shipped to other states and that we had to have either process apples or apples that were less desirable, um, second rate um, or medium grade uh, apples rather than the premium or first rate, first grade apples. Alchin Allen explained this, why the good apples which were grown in Washington by most of them were exported. And they did this by noting that shipping cost of apples from the state of Washington to, let's say, the city of Washington, D.C., all the way across the country, were the same whether you shipped a crate of premium quality apples or low quality apples. And that fixed cost reduced the relative price of premium to second rate apples in the city of Washington. And it's just a matter of simple arithmetic in some sense. Let's say um, one, one pound of, of premium apples cost 50 cents, whereas one pound of the second uh, rate apples was 25 cents in the state of Washington. Okay, so you're basically getting, uh, you can get two pounds of low grade for one pound of high grade. Transport cost. Well, let's say it costs another 50 cents to transport them from one end of the country to the other. So that the selling price in Washington, D.C., is going to be one dollar for the premium and seventy five cents for the second rate second grade cut of apples so in Washington, in order to get one pound of the premium grade apples, you give up the equivalent of two pounds of second class apples second class apples in other words, you can get twice as much for the same amount of money. Whereas in the city of Washington, one pound of premium grade apples is only worth one and a third pound of the second grade. So in the state of Washington, You're looking at the choice of one pound versus two pounds. And in the city of Washington, your choice is one pound and one, one, one third pounds. So given those different prices, the people in Washington are more likely to go for the lower quality apple and the people in Washington, the city of Washington, D.C., are more likely to go for the high-priced apple. This also pertains to potatoes. Um, people far away from the potato-growing regions, where the transportation costs are great, are more likely to get the premium-grade potatoes. Potatoes that are unbruised, uh, potatoes that are uniform in size, Whereas, if you go to Idaho, I've only been there one time, but um, I noticed that both in the restaurant and in the stores, I mean, they were very fine potatoes. But the ones in the store were all not the nice uniform ones that we get in our stores. And in the restaurant that I was in, I got a 
humongous potato, but it was nothing that was ever going to be shipped. I mean, it was like two and a half pound potato. Um, lobsters are the same way. Um, if you're going to ship a lobster, you're going to put a lobster in a tank, put it on an airplane, and ship it from Maine to Auburn. You're not going to ship second-rate lobsters. You're going to ship the primo ones. And it turns out that the best-tasting lobsters are about one and a half pounds each. That's one of their prime age. So if they go down into the sea in Maine and New York and where, Boston, wherever, and they pull up little teeny lobsters, they're not going to be that good. And you can pull up huge lobsters. <coughs> when I was in, um, uh, it was in Massachusetts, out on Cape Cod, went into a fish market, and they had like a 25-pound lobster there. And I thought, wow, that would be so neat. I mean, you can't imagine how much butter you'd need for something like that. But the guy said, oh, no, there's no way in the world you'd want to eat this thing. We just keep it around just to show tourists. But um, it's, you know, it's just something that you would never eat. You always want that, op, that, that sort of premium age, premium size uh, lobster. And those are the ones that get shipped out because of the high transportation costs. Um, more in terms of uh, a blockade type situation uh, occurs right here in the city of Auburn. Uh, does anybody in here go to the Auburn football games? Couple takers. Um, well, it's it's kind of a very unusual thing that occurs here in Auburn. Uh, six Saturdays of the year, approximately. Um, the people of Auburn and Auburn fans tend to be almost, at least generally, uh, beer drinkers. If they're, not, if they're if they're a drinker, they tend to be beer drinkers. Not a lot of, you know, high-end wine consumers. Um, not a lot of martini drinkers. There's no martini bars, you know, that kind of thing. It tends to be mostly beer drinkers around here. And if you come to the games, there'll be people all around the whole area, and generally, if they're drinking alcohol products, they're drinking beer. And then something very unusual happens. They have to cross through what amounts to a blockade or a prohibition. Because in order to get into that stadium, you have to go through a checkpoint. And if you try to cross that checkpoint with alcohol and it's discovered, it can be confiscated, you may be kicked out of the stadium, uh, and things of that nature. What about the people in the skybox? They get there. <laughs> more, we're all equal here, but some are more equal than others. That's right, Ozzy. And I'll, don't worry, I'll invite you up to my skybox next year. <laughs> Good. It's no fun up there. <laughs> That's right. You don't want to go to a skybox. It's like watching, watching it on a, a television. It's like watching it on a giant TV. <laughs> you can't. You're isolated. But, you're cut off from society. but if, well, if, party, yeah. yeah. But if we look down in the stands, we see that a lot of people are not obeying the, this prohibition against alcohol. They're actually consuming alcohol and they're not consuming beer. So this 85,000 group, maybe a certain percentage of them are drinking alcohol or are alcohol drinkers and a certain percentage of them continue to drink inside the stadium, but they don't drink beer. You cannot get a keg past the checkpoint. As a matter of fact, it's pretty difficult to even get a 12-pack or even a 6-pack by the checkpoint, but the risk is very high. Um, but you can get uh, whiskey and whiskey-like products, uh, rum, bourbon, things of that nature, past the security guards. As a matter of fact, there's a whole industry of ways of getting things past there. How about uh, the night before? You uh, tape it under your seat where you're going to sit. Well, you can't get in the night before. It's a, it's a good thought, Ozzy, but uh, they don't let you in the night before. Um, oh, I see. It's all Yeah, it's all enclosed. Yeah, it's closed and nobody gets in until game time. That's right. And, um, and so, you know, the, the types of things that are consumed in there 
the, to the tastes and preferences of the individuals um, are totally tilted because of the, the risk associated with bringing in alcohol products. Uh, people go for the smaller, more compact, more alcohol per ounce. You know, the, the bigger bang for your buck, essentially. Um, and it's that prohibition line or that blockade line that changes the risk-reward scenario in favor of the product with more alcohol per ounce or per uh, area of volume. The same thing uh, holds true with illegal drugs. The prohibition against illegal drugs sets up kind of like a, a pro prohibition boundary around the United States to make it more difficult to get, say, marijuana from Columbia, South America into Columbia, South Carolina. And the risks of running that blockade are tremendous. You, of course, lose all your, your drugs, you lose your plane or your boat, um, and you get thrown in jail for a number of years. And so the risk associated with running that kind of blockade is very significant, and it makes up almost entirely the price of illegal drugs. So that drugs in marijuana in Columbia, South Carolina, uh, Columbia, um, South America, may be only $50 a pound. But when it gets into the United States, it may be on the range of 1000 or 2000 or three or $4,000 a pound. So that transport cost makes up a huge percentage of it. So when people are looking to run drugs, they are always looking for the more potent version of the product, whatever it happens to be. So that's what they're buying because it's more potency, more compact, more value, um, economic value, um, and gives you greater concealability. Smaller packages, smaller, faster modes of transportation, and ultimately more profits when the deal is done. So in all of these cases, we see that um, these blockades or these prohibition boundaries that people have to pass through, whether it's the football stadium, whether it's the illegal drug catching network, um, or even more subtly in the case of just moving uh, apples from one part of the country to another, change relative prices and they change the composition of imports and exports. And so we speak of luxuries and necessities. And the book has, quote, several observers from the period to this effect that people were complaining, people were upset that um, these luxury goods were passing uh, into their economy, soaking up their dollars, and yet there wasn't enough food to feed children in many cases. But what we're really looking at is goods that have high economic value relative to the bulk of the product. Okay, Those goods are going to be favorably affected by a blockade, whereas products that are really bulky and not without much value are going to be adversely <coughs> affected by running the blockade into the South. Um, we develop uh, some examples and, and some evidence uh, to this effect. And I'm going to try to go through this um, example in a little detail. Uh, it's a hard concept to um, grasp in, in many respects. And it certainly a, it was a hard one to find concrete statistical evidence for. As you see in the book, we had a lot of difficulty trying to um, bring out that evidence. We set up this scenario where pre-war, one pound of coffee is equal in price to two pounds of sugar. So coffee, they're both about the same size, 
per pound of each. But um, sugar was less expensive. It was coffee that had more value relative to its bulk. And it really was a, a, um, a, uh, a luxury good. We quote uh, one observer who noted that jewel, a jewelry store in Atlanta was using coffee beans instead of diamonds in women's jewelry because diamonds were kind of beside the point at this point, but coffee really uh, had such a special meaning that they would even use it in women's jewelry. Okay, and then let's, um, and that um, pre war, a pound of coffee is equal to one dollar, and two pounds of sugar is equal to one dollar. So this is also equal to one dollar. Then we add an extra dollar of transportation cost. If we add an extra dollar of transportation cost, then one pound of coffee is going to be equal to two dollars. But its previous equivalent over here is now going to cost three dollars. A dollar for the sugar and an extra dollar for each pound of transportation. So that um, the sugar is rising in cost relative to the coffee. And as we raise the transportation cost, at another dollar, the coffee becomes three dollars, but the sugar is now going to be equal to five dollars. A dollar for the sugar and two dollars for each pound of transport cost. So again, the price of sugar is rising relative to the price of coffee. Okay, it's the same, it's the same business. The blockade runners aren't really particular about what they're running. They're running for, to make a profit. And as we raise that transportation cost ever higher, sugar becomes relatively more and more expensive to coffee. And conversely, while coffee is going up in price, it's still getting relatively less expensive for consumers. Okay, so in your overall basket of choices, you're going to veer more and more towards coffee and less and less towards sugar. And this is, and this is the, the, more or less the foundation behind the idea that goods with high value relative to their bulk are going to fall in price relative to goods that are low value relative to the bulk, the weight and the volume that they have on the ships. And so what we saw, um, or what we can look back to see, was that certain items were just way too heavy to be even considered uh, to be imported uh, into the south. The ships were getting smaller, and so certain types of machinery, for example, is just cost prohibitive to try to import those uh, types of things into the south. And other things that were um, just very bulky relative to their value, grain products, for example, uh, is just way too expensive transportation-wise to bring those in. And there's lots of uh, anecdotal evidence about the types of products. And if you look through those anecdotes, what you'll see is that the types of goods that were coming through Yes, they were luxury goods, but interspersed with them were non-luxury goods that just happened to be high value relative to their bulk. Okay. In order to 
Not to prove this, but to better illustrate this and to better investigate this phenomenon, we did some empirical statistical work uh, to try to back it up. And uh, there's a surprising amount of good evidence that's available uh, about what was happening in the South. Um, a political scientist named Schwab, for example, uh, developed a list of prices for 22 commodities in the South uh, during the Civil War. And using that data, we were able to um, show what was happening to the price of uh, the, the price of luxury prices to necessities. And what we showed, um, simply put, was that the price of luxury goods during the war was actually declining. For much of the war, the, the prices of luxury goods was declining. At the same time, that capture rates, okay, so this is capture rates, and this is luxury prices. And this is time. And then, at the end of the war, remember the capture rates declined fairly, fairly drastically, and the price of luxury goods turned up. So the, the general feel for the data as best we could reconstruct them is that... Um, and sometimes this stuff is remarkable that it actually comes out, <laughs> comes out according to theory, especially when you read about the conditions and the conditions of the market and uh, the chaos. It's hard to uh, imagine how, how well markets can adjust to those type of things. But uh, the theory really does hold up. As, as the, block, as the um, blockade become, becomes stricter, the price of luxury goods falls. And it wasn't to the end where the capture rate really fell off, that the price of luxury goods uh, went up. Now, there's a lot of, a lot of things going on here. Um, Southerners are getting poor. Uh, ports are being closed. Um, the government is commandeering boats. Um, and, of course, they're not working off of, a pri uh, uh, off of a hardcore price system with profits and losses. They're just commandeering in. Um, stacking boats with war supplies. So there's a lot of things going on here that could upset this data and could have painted a different picture um, of what we actually see statistically. And we also, <clears throat> to for further sort of illustrate and investigate this hypothesis to see, you know, is this the real reason, uh, we looked at... <clears throat> a set of luxury goods and a set of necessities. Um, and again, these are poorly defined creatures. We do use coffee and tea as the luxury goods, the ones with a high value per bulk. And then we used necessities, sugar and molasses. Um, now, sugar actually was considered a luxury good in the South during the Civil War. It was difficult to get. Uh, once New Orleans had been captured, um, it was very difficult to get. Coffee was very d difficult to get. Um, the Southerners used all sorts of uh, substitutes for these products. They would um, take um, various nuts and twigs and flowers and grasses, uh, burn them, and then put the put the end result in water, boiling water, to make a coffee substitute, or they would mix things like burnt chicory um, in with the coffee to make it last longer. Um, and they would use, of course, tea products over and over again until they produced no results. Um, and they would make tea substitutes as well. So there was, you know, actually all of these products were 
uh, in tight supply. But if you look at coffee and tea in the import mix, they were much more luxury goods than sugar and molasses. And we have prices uh, from various cities in the south. I think it was uh, Richmond. Um, Richmond, Montgomery, um, and I've forgotten the other ones. We had four cities where the prices were in the newspaper, basically, and could be collected from the old newspapers. And um, to set up time series data um, of these prices, of the prices of coffee and tea and the prices of sugar and molasses, uh, in order to see how well the capture rate of boats coming into the South explained the changes in prices. And I'm not going to get into the uh, statistical methods and, and that kind of stuff, but <clears throat> we got some evidence that suggests support for the notion that the, that the number or percentages of ships that were being captured really was the most dominant influence on tilting the prices of luxuries versus necessities. And the more ships they captured, the more likely the blockade runners would try to run luxury goods through rather than necessities. So basically we feel that we have the mystery solved with respect to why necessities were shunned during a war effort and why luxuries were relatively available. Uh, we call it the Rhett Butler effect. Uh, but it's really the blockade's effect. Um, how strong the blockade became made <coughs> the problem on the home front, and this was really a problem of morale, of southern morale, that luxury goods would be easy to come by and necessities would be very difficult to come by, and it's in many cases just simply not available to Southerners in their economy. Okay. Uh, any questions about any of this stuff? Yes, Claire. I think if I were like running my household and the budget I could be cutting in, I would probably be looking at necessities, so I would spend more, I mean the price of necessities going up. Would, would not allow me to buy the luxury items. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean. Uh, See, if, if I can say it's more complicated. It is very complicated, and it's an effect that um, does not affect everybody in the same direction. Um, for example, um, if they put a 50 cent tax on gasoline, 50 cents per gallon, both on premium and regular, um, that might cause some people to switch from premium to regular, and it might cause other people to switch from regular to premium. But the overall effect is that it's going to encourage more people to buy more of the premium gas. There's going to be less gasoline purchased overall, but it's going to tilt it in the direction of that more potent gas. So you may get some college students who say, you know, I can't afford it anymore, so I'm going to go to the lower. And then you might get some more calculating business types and think, well, you know, I'm paying 50 cents no matter which one I get. So you get more bang for the buck, so to speak, with that higher octane gasoline. So, so we're not looking at that individuals, because there are a lot of individuals who actually did do exactly what you suggest is that you you spend all of your income on the necessities, um, basically food um, and nothing else. That would be basically it. Another thing this does, um, the more tight the blockade becomes, is it forces Southerners to do what? They have to start making their own stuff. They have to become more self-sufficient and less working from their comparative advantage. So the southern economy is 
transformed, a lot of it voluntarily, a lot of it Southerners just um, moving their production from cotton to other crops. Um, likewise, people in the city. Uh, and then the government actually forces a lot of self-sufficiency. Instead of saying, we're going to get our pistols from Europe, or our swords from Europe, or our military buttons, uh, or our cannons from Europe, they decided in many cases to rely on domestic production so that Southerners would have to start from scratch in many cases to learn how to do things that they had never done before. And that is, uh, it's kind of nice to have your own munitions plants and, and that kind of thing, but it's also very, very expensive because if you don't have the expertise, if you don't have the comparative advantage, if you don't have the right resource mix, it becomes very difficult. And there's industry after industry, like building warships. Initially, they decided they'd buy from Europe. They ran into a lot of problems with that. So they turned to domestic production, both the Confederates and the state governments, uh, and they started building warships. Uh, but they didn't have the machinery. They didn't have the technical knowledge or the expertise. They had difficulty in procuring the materials, the boat, the armaments, the, the metal plating, um, things of that nature. And so the ships were poorly constructed, took them a long time. Um, most of them were actually captured or destroyed before they were actually put to use. So, you know, the end result of these higher prices that are, are coming into the southern economy is a lot of movement towards self-sufficiency. And uh, that, again, is a, is a very difficult blow to an economy. This is basically what Germany tried to do during World War I and World War II um, because of their strategic position. They were either or potentially surrounded by enemy combatants who weren't exactly going to allow them to trade with the rest of the world. And so Germany had to, uh, they had to turn to the strategy of self-sufficiency and domestic production. In their case, you can make a much better case for Germany doing something like that because they had a much more, even at that time, a much more diverse economy with agriculture, manufacturing, uh, and so on. In a highly skilled and diverse labor and and things of that nature, and yet it's still really um, the the critical blows, um, you know, in the German economy were uh, were those resource shortages, and, and you know, towards the end of both wars, it, it really stuck out like a sore thumb, where you know they couldn't do so much on the battlefield because they were lacking the necessary resources in their home front economy. Yes. Mark, uh, during this period, the war period, uh, what happened, uh, say, uh, uh, with commerce in particular, I mean, the war between the North and, uh, say, Canada and the Americans, uh, and, say, Texas uh, in the South uh, and Mexico? It, it seems there were just some opportunities there. Yes, uh, both sides, um, the, the trade patterns, um, changed quite a bit. For example, the Northwest, you know, Iowa and uh, Minnesota, places like that, Indiana, uh, Illinois, would trade, send their grain products to the South. That changed. The grain products subsequently went East, to the East and to, the, and to Europe. Um, and a lot of American grain started flowing out over to Europe. Um, there was, I guess, some more trade between the North and Canada. Um, and the South did uh, try to develop trade routes into Mexico. That wasn't really that successful. The transportation cost of getting things over to Texas 
and then into Mexico, and then you're into Mexico and there's really no international shipping routes. So that really was a possibility, but the the there was no railroad, for example, all the way from uh, Texas down into Mexico at the time. Texas did have some railroads, but it was to exploit local cotton production. So basically, you get to the end of the line, and then all of a sudden you're walking, or you're in a you know a uh, a uh, cart drawing uh, products, and so. It was uh, it was very difficult. They, you know, the idea of shipping the Texas cotton out of the Confederacy through Mexico to Europe. Um, they've looked at the cost of doing all that, and it, it um, there wasn't you know it wasn't just a easy profit opportunity. Um, and so, you know, transportation costs we we take so much for granted nowadays uh, with electronic information and um, all sorts of modes of different transportation. Back then, things were much more difficult. And actually, um, you know, things like the railroad were, was very, very important uh, to, the, to the economy and to the war. But it was brand new and not as extensively available um, as it is today. So they tried that. <clears throat> But um, it didn't. It didn't really work out for them. There was not much cotton exported through Mexico that they could tell. And another thing that is kind of interesting is that there was a there was still a north south trade. Uh, there was a little bit of running between the states, but there was actually an official uh, trade between the north and south where the s southern armies would trade. Um, cotton with the northern armies in return for usually beef or some sort of food product that they needed. They wouldn't trade obviously ammunition or uniforms but they would trade those basic commodities. Uh, the north needed the cotton. Uh, cotton was very expensive in the north. They needed cotton for the cotton mills in, the, uh, in New England and so there was political pressure on the Lincoln administration to cut deals. And, um, you know, the Confederates were happy to go along with it when they were in such dire need, uh, particularly for beef products for the troops. What about the exchange of, of, of officers or captured officers or captured? I mean, that, that, that seemed to me a peculiar thing to, to have a periodic exchange of Especially when these guys were pretty good at what they did. I mean, how did they? Uh, how did you know, Ozzy, it was a it was an entirely different world at that time. Um, if if you were captured in a battle, um, chances are you would be paroled, and so they would take your gun and they would wipe out a piece of paper, and it would say, you know, I agree not to fight for at least 10 months or something. And you'd sign that. Um, and people basically went along with that. They were happy to be sent home. Uh, and if you were recaptured, uh, I think they could shoot you on the spot. Uh, so that was... a time limit that you swore not to fight. Right. And so that was quite common. And, and also, um, you know, with the blockade runners, uh, they would be released as well. Um, no, no, the blockade runners could run over and over again. They didn't have to be paroled because they weren't they weren't a military force. They were just uh, not pirates, sailors, oh. and um, and and the and the blockade runners would very often get in the bidding for the boat that they had just lost. So those kind of things were much more fluid. Now towards the end of the war, the uh, Union stops paroling, they, they stop having these prisoner exchanges where one side would agree to turn over so many and the other side would match it. Um, and that stopped uh, later in the war. And this is when the prisoner populations in the north and south started to grow and where all of these nasty problems about people dying in these prisons. Andersonville, the most notable, but Elmira up in New York, um, you know, 
these were places, uh, the, certainly the, the Confederacy didn't had, had no resources to, um, to take care of these troops. Uh, they had barely enough resources to, to, you know, keep them in one spot. Um, and, you know, so that was, uh, that was another change in war tactics, um, where the previous tendency was either kill your enemy or parole them or trade them or something or sell them as a slave. Um, uh, but get them out of your hair, get them back to work somehow. And then at that point, I'm not saying that was the first point in world history where this is done, but at that point there, after that there was no or few exchanges and, you know, basically the, the soldiers were put in some sort of government confinement. There was still the element of chivalry there, though. I mean, you know, the... Yes. The, uh, I mean, everybody who was in it was brought up in, in that tradition. Mm-hmm. Um, but the whole thing, that I think I would say that that's where the, that whole tradition starts to break down. Okay, it's 3.30, so we will end today's short session. I'm sorry about that, but I hope you all get a chance to uh, see the special lecture and be back here next week at 2.30. Uh, We've got some interesting things to do because next week we're going to start to look at um, why the South shot itself in the foot.